Good evening. It is 630 and this is the borough council work session on July 16th, 2024. Um, I'm Nicole Shimon or Patrick McCoy as he is not here this evening as well. Sheila Vaccaro is not here, but otherwise I'm with my cohort and we will begin. We're calling it to order. We'll start with the pledge of allegiance. Brian Travis, since you were looking at me, you can lead that for us. Thank you. And now we'll open it up to comments, suggestions, petitions by residents in attendance regarding items not on the agenda. Daryl Cook, I like safety. One thing that doesn't make drivers better is frustration. When car number two has to wait for car number two, one to back into a parking space, car number three is blocking the intersection. This is what I've observed at High and Minor Streets. Traffic flow is interrupted by bump outs. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, we will move to item number four. Consider long-term lease proposal with the Westchester Railroad Company owned and operated by Four States Railway Service Incorporated. Good evening, uh, members of council, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm Derek Slifer, uh, operations manager for the uh, Westchester Railroad and uh, Four States Railway Service. And uh, we're here tonight, um, as we've mentioned before, uh, of uh, entering a 15 year lease, sublease with the borough uh, via SEPTA uh, so we can continue to operate the uh, Westchester Railroad. Um, a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Metric and uh, Ms. Camp uh, about uh, some specifics that were in the lease, and uh, we we kind of came to an agreement with some things that should be in there, some some things that uh, shouldn't be in there. Um, so I'm here to answer uh, any questions that uh, anyone may have, or uh, any comments that anyone may have to uh, with regarding that lease. Now, my my understanding is that the the lease is that we looked at that we had an opportunity to review was the lease between SEPTA and the borough. Sean, can yes. So we don't yet have the lease between the borough and um, four states. Correct. Okay. okay. So um, so just for for everyone. But does anyone have any comments on what they read about the that lease that we did see? Sean, did you have any comments or notes that you wanted to provide? Yeah, you are correct. There are essentially two leases that need to be agreed to. One is between SEPTA and the borough, and that was what was forwarded. That's that's the attachment uh, up on the screen right now, which is the lease that was entered into in 2008 and an amendment to that in 2011. What I circulated in an email to council, since this is a lease negotiation, uh, were the talking points that we went over with Mr. Slifer and um, in bold in that lease are some things that we discussed and agreed to, but council would need to agree to those terms in order for us to get to the next step with the SEPTA and borough lease. What we haven't done yet is the companion sublease between the borough and Westchester Railroad. Now, those two documents all have to be approved by SEPTA and uh, I would like to get these done as soon as possible, work with Mr. Slifer and get the sublease teed up for next month as well. So we can get both documents through council and on their way to SEPTA so we can get this uh, lease, leasing issue resolved for the long term uh, before the end of the year when we have to then renew again for another one, ter one year term option of the existing lease. So I'd like to get this done and if there are no, if everyone's okay with what was circulated, um, I think the action item before council would be to uh, cons consider the the lease agreement that was with the changes that were circulated between the borough and SEPTA, knowing that we still have to do some work with Westchester Railroad to get the sublease teed up for you in August. 
I think the only question did you have. I, I do have a question. The the document, Mr. Metric, the documents that we did read, and Kristen talked about uh, four states will provide inspection reports under subsection X. Okay, and it says they're they're supposed to do all the inspections and give it monthly reports to the borough. But I don't feel comfortable with the inspection process without an FRA report once a year uh, adjoining their four states inspection. You know, the, the uh, um, I know they don't want to hurt anybody on the train and they don't want to damage any of their equipment. But when you self inspect after a while, uh, when you when you see something over and over again, just like graffiti, you learn to accept it. And not saying that you guys are missing anything, but a, a second look from FRA, uh, a company, you said they do that once a year with you guys. That'd be really important for us to have your inspection reports with the FRA reports. So, and, and somebody to explain, us, explain to us what the differences are, because we wouldn't know if, we don't know a ballast from a nail or, or, or a, a railroad tie. You know, if they say something's deficient, we need somebody to tell us that it's deficient, the FRA, and then you guys you know, you need to repair it. So that, you know, that, that was my only, only concern with it. Right. You were doing your own inspections and, you know, doctors don't treat themselves. They always go to somebody else because they have a fresher look at the situation. Okay. So and that was my, my concern about the, understood. what I read. Yes, understood. Um, we actually did provide uh, about two or three years worth of FRA inspections to Mr. Metric uh, when we met with him back in April. Um, so we we did provide that information. I'm not sure if it made its way to council, uh, but we did provide some examples of when they come out. Um, the thing with the FRA is it they don't come out on a set schedule. It's always a surprise visit. And they have an FRA official for crossings. They have an FRA official for track equipment, uh, operating rules. So is the borough interested in all of those reports or just the, the track reports and the, you know, the, the, the right of way, because there's five, six, seven departments that may come out and they all have a different concentration. So, um, my question to you would be, would I, would we just provide all of that information uh, to the, to the borough? Derek, as I just mentioned to you, we don't know the difference between a spike and a, and a, and a ballast. Right. So when they do, my opinion is when they do an inspection mm -hmm. and if something's deficient, mm -hmm. that should, you know, that, that should alert your team. Right. And at that point you should, your team, you're supposed to get monthly reports, I think from this report. Right. Uh, bring, you know, the, the flare to us. Mm -hmm. So we know that, you know, the underpinning of one of the bridges, it right. needs, a, needs attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the insurance things and the safety things for are, are more important than, you know, whether the thing's riding smooth or not to me. Right. Yeah. So, yep. and, and, and we, we agree with that. And, uh, we have been providing track reports. We've been providing bridge reports, um, as per the lease um and they i i'm once they go to the borough i'm not sure how they're distributed so i don't know if members of council would get these reports or if they would stay with uh you know the borough manager uh, we're not sure how that's uh distributed uh but we do provide uh monthly reports um i i, I will say this um the fra allows for all railroads to um have their own inspection programs. And uh, basically the FRA says, well, what you submit to us, we're gonna trust that you do. And when we come out and inspect, we're gonna be looking at what you said you're gonna do and what you're actually doing. So we're under the gun all the time uh, for surprise inspections. So, um, you know, I just wanna make that very clear um, that those inspections happen about four times a week, maybe. And uh, our, our it, it's funny, our ratio of inspections versus the number of trains we run, we do like four times as many inspection as number of trains that we run. So um, so the railroad absolutely is getting looked at um, and it's absolutely 
um, you know, safety is our number one concern. And uh, we have to please you. We understand that. We have to please SEPTA because we understand that as well. Um, they'll also come out and do inspections as well. We're not always privileged to those reports. When they come out, uh, a lot of times they'll come out, they'll look, and sometimes they don't come out and do inspections on, you know, the whole railroad. They'll just, all right, well, we're just going to look at crossings this week, or we're just going to look at, uh, do a walking inspection. You know, it's always, uh, it's never a complete point A to point D inspection where they look at everything. So it's, it's kind of fragmented. Red flags that I'm, that, that yeah. I'm really concerned about. And if you're, if you're coming once a month now, mm -hmm. all you need, you know, I think for council, all we need to know is that a uh, clean bill of health yep. for July, 2024, mm -hmm. no infractions. And, uh, and I, I think in that way there, it's on the record as well. Mm -hmm. And it's in the, the public domain, you know, Correct. And council will know, you know, they said we, we wouldn't know reading through this. Reading. Right. Thank you. Right. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? That I, I can just was. I was just going to piggyback on that because I, I had raised a red flag for me too because what, um, from a previous meeting during annual report, um, maybe even prior to that, with the rail uh, restoration committee, had brought up the fact that you know third party inspections were something that, that should happen. Hmm. Um, Mr. Mr. Metric had mentioned that third party is SEPTA and FRA in this case, and we have been receiving or they have been conducting reports, but we weren't sure. Yeah what the next step was and right. when we went through your your um your annual report um it didn't mention it so i think that that was probably what what raised a red flag it, for me because i say it didn't mention it or? i didn't mention specifically reports from the fra and septa okay. it mentioned all the reports like everything you just talked about and your self inspections but we weren't sure where they so it's just before we were you know we're having these discussions about yes. renewing a lease and a long term lease we just wanted to make sure that all those Right. Eyes were dotted. Yes, He's absolutely. Crossed, and, so. and we understand that. Um, like I said, I gave everything uh, up to uh, they haven't FRA has not been out yet this year and there's no telling when they'll be out. Uh, they always seem to do it in like blitzes. Um, I gave Mr. Metric everything up to 2023, maybe the th past three years. Uh, FRA came out twice and PUC came out once and they inspected the crossings. Um, so I did give those reports to Mr. Metric and, uh, you know, any infractions that they found were, were very small and were corrected right away. So we never, uh, you know, we never leave anything out there. You know, if they find something, we fix it right away. I think Brian and I were going to say the same thing. I, and just for confirmation, the FRA inspections one are occurring and if i recall they are part of a, the previous lease i seem to recall reading that the fra inspections one are occurring yes. and have been occurring yes um and that to mr travis's point around the third party the the fra and the septa inspections meet that third party requirement that was raised earlier and they were part of the uh, previous lease Okay. Um, any other comment? No. Okay. The, the only other thing, this isn't like lease pending or anything, but I'd love to see a P and L from you guys too. Like, I know we had the report like earlier this year, but I don't recall a P and L with that. And so I'd love like, you know, again, it's not going to influence mm -hmm. the, the decision on the lease per se, but if you, if you got, I'm assuming you have one and if you can get that forwarded over to us too, that would be good to take okay. a look at for us. Yes. But, but otherwise, Sean, it sounds like as long as the, the um, council gets an opportunity to see or get some information from the re most recent FRA reports that we're all okay with what you circulated to your original question. So, okay. All right, um, and any public comment? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Is there general consensus to move this item to the consent agenda for tomorrow? We could, I, I'm fine with that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.
All right, and so now we'll move to the uh, the administration communication and technology committee. We'll start with item number five: discuss forming a Westchester Borough Transportation Committee. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Mr. Vice President. We um, had discussed this item also. I think um, uh, it kind of came out of of um, some questions uh, regarding the Rail Restoration Committee and whether or not we had a full complement of of um, transportation modes that we were considering beyond rail. And um, and so we discussed it a couple times. I think it came up in Smart Growth, and then it ended up being um, a discussion item for the, the most recent. At committee meeting, because um, it is it's an administration uh, administrative topic, um, and so Sheila and I discussed it. Um, Mr. McGinnis next to me was was unable to connect um, electronically, and we talked in our conversation. We talked a little bit about scope, what this committee would do, how we would stand it up, you know, generalizations about what membership might look like, and then with the suggestion of Sean and and probably capturing some of the previous conversations too. Um, we decided to put together a, uh, a document that was circulated. It's actually not up on the screen. Um, I don't know that this one made it to the agenda. It did. It's so, item number Bill, five. Bill, I think you have it. Some, like, yeah. I think so Sean sent it pull that up. So we, this is just a draft, but what we essentially did was captured our conversation and sort of the goals, purpose, and mission of this new committee that we're recommending that we actually stand up. Um, so I'll just read kind of summarize the, the top, the top part of it. Um, you know, this, this is a volunteer committee, just like our other advisory committees that would be basically in charge of, of understanding and communicating, you know, any practical modes of transportation within Westchester borough or to and from. So commuting, but also circulating. Um, and then, uh, you know, so that would be the purpose of the committee and then it's, it's mission or, you know, what it does on a regular basis is. Basically, to meet and present future transportation needs recommendations for all residents of the borough, um, visitors and commuters of Westchester. So uh, we laid in a few goals. I'm just going to go over a couple of them. Um, help borough help borough council understand what transportation modes we already have. Um, sort of do a gap analysis to determine, you know, are they meeting sufficient needs, or, you know, do we potentially need recommendations for additional modes of transportation? Um, and one of the uh, deliverables that we would see out of this committee would be to develop reports. And another one would be to actually conduct a multimodal transportation study, similar to how Phoenixville uh, did back in 2018. Um, so that really kind of summarizes most of what we discussed and what we put here on a page. Um, I'll open up any questions, comments, or any anyone from the, the dais? It's a good start. The uh, like I mentioned before, the it would be great to have the uh, university deeply involved with it because they promised us four or five years ago because they have a bus that transverses the the, the borough every day with students, and uh, they wanted to see if they could get it off the ground and make it viable for them because they have uh, professors that live around the, uh, the borough and students that live around the borough and they can hop on and hop off. And uh, it's probably our fault because we never followed up with them uh, to see why we were not being able to use it. But they, they actually have what I think we're looking for, you know, going up and down streets in the borough, you know, carrying people uh, that need to go to the grocery store, to the drugstore, uh, you know, various places around, around the borough. And uh, there is not a fee uh, for the students that I know of. It's just an access for the kids to get on and off. So, yeah, I think it's a great start. Any public comments about a transportation committee? Tyler Haney, uh, would this be, if this committee was to be established, would this be a superseding or a replacement for the Rail Restoration Committee, or would this be an additional committee? We're not quite sure what the relationship between the two would be right now. This would be a separate committee. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a two 
zero recommendation from the committee to move this forward. So I can make, make a motion to move this to the consent agenda. All right, I'll second that. Yeah, consent. Can you please clarify what uh, you would like? Is this a motion? Because the agenda just says basically we, we were going to have a discussion and we just did. Do you, uh, is the motion to um, direct the solicitor to draft a zoning, uh, excuse me, a uh, ordinance amendment creating this committee or does it need more discussion? Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to need more discussion on this. Just, just to clarify that we're all in agreement on the scope and we have total buy-in from, from okay. the council. Um, is, is this an ad hoc committee? That's what, that was the expression used last week. Is that what this is? Or I think you need discussion on whether this is replacing the rail committee as he asked or not. Because it seems redundant. I mean, it seems like it broadens the scope, including rail and and so many other modes of transportation that it would make the other committee, I don't know, obsolete. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, dis we'll discuss it further. So we'll, we would like to. So you're gonna add, add it to the act committee next yeah. month yeah. to continue the kind of conversation? I would recommend tabling it to the act committee next month. Yeah. yeah. Madam. So, so wait a minute, let, let me make sure I understand. Um, yeah, what, what do we, what do we want to accomplish? The chair can refer this item to committee for further discussion. Okay. And so with the idea of, um, coming back with. A little bit more fleshed out or something next month. Yeah, we have some open questions about the rail restoration committee. So, yeah, we love Okay. It. Sounds good. All right. So, we'll give it, take it back to committee. All right. Thank you. So, uh, right. So, moving on to number six, um, discuss the Reorganization Westchester Borough Council Committee and meetings agendas. This was another item that we um, discussed in ACT. We had a re recommendation of 2 0 to, um, to modify the agenda that we currently use for both committee, um, the work session, and the voting session to um, allow a little bit more clarity in terms of what's a new business item and what's something that's been recurring. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback and a lot of buy-in from actually from um, borough administration on this one too. Um, and we, we would recommend actually, um, if I could, I would, I would like to make a motion just to approve um, the, the new format and um, start adopting it. Yeah, the, the one thing I, I want to point out is, um, I, you know, I love the, the, the reports and kind of separating some things out. I, I also think that there's opportunity, and I've, I think I've said this to you before, um, to not just improve where we bucket things in the agenda, but also the agenda items and how we state them themselves. Um, you know, just even in particular this week, when I read the agenda item about the, the, the lease, it almost sounds like it's the lease between the borough and the four states, but really the lease that we had to talk about tonight was the lease between SEPTA and the borough. So how can we do a better job of, of putting that information in our bullet points or, or even going back to that night where we had a, a full a packed audience to talk about the, the, the lot 10 building. Um, the way that the agenda had been interpreted was that we at smart growth approved this building and we're recommending it and bringing it to council to discuss and potentially approve and and that wasn't actually the discussion or how things came out of smart growth smart growth was actually had a lot of questions and wasn't really on board with that particular building in that particular place but wanted it to be an item to to create an awareness and have a conversation so but but the way it was listed on the agenda created a lot of confusion and in, in with our residents and and that's where when the 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 people showed up 
they had a very different perspective of what they were what they were coming to push back on. So so this is this is great and this is something that can be helpful, but I also think that we also have a lot of opportunity to improve not just where things are bucketed, but how we word them. So um, that's just my recommendation as well. I think another thing that'll help too is that I like the third bullet point under additional considerations just to introduce a standard practice for uh, department heads that the motions fall under that they just generate a small few sentences paragraph or, or whatever they need to to explain what the motion is about. I think that's going to help out a lot other than just the the thing. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm for it. I think Brian did a lot of good work with this. I think it makes everything more in line with Robert's rules of order. And I think as long as we get used to that, the public gets used to that and makes the it'll and help the flow of the meetings and provide you know our constituents with the with the most accurate and up to date information. So I I'm I'm for it. Yeah, I'm for it as well as long as we get a cheat sheet that we can put up here and we can follow because it's going to be something far into what we've been doing in the past and uh we want to try to make sure that we all do the right the same thing. Yeah, this appears um self-explanatory to me and provides more clarity on discussion items, voting items, you know, what we're actually voting on or action items. All right, sounds like consent to me. Sounds like there's general consensus here to consent to uh, a motion to change our meeting meeting agenda format according to the attachment. A any uh, comments from those in attendance here? Okay. We'll move on to parking and I believe the parking committee because there was not a um, a quorum during the, the committee last week. Uh, and so there's no committee recommendations we can go through and maybe talk a little bit about it, but otherwise we'll have to table the, the information or the, the voting to next next round. Madam Vice President, I did, I did speak because I was, I was uh, on the call, but it was deemed illegal uh, and then later deemed legal. So we did not have a quorum for that night. And I have spoke to uh, the parking director and she has no trouble with the four items that are on here. Uh, nothing is time bound at this particular moment and can go to uh, August. Anything we wanna take a moment to at least discuss here and get it out into the public so that they know what's happening? Ramsey. Uh. Yeah, before Ramsey speaks, I think procedurally, and Michael, you can tell me if I'm off off base here. Um, what typically happens in the way we conduct our business is the committees meet and make recommendations to council for approval, and then the council hears these items with a committee recommendation. And the committees allow us to talk in a little more detail about the items you're acting upon. Um, I don't think there's any reason you can't have a discussion right now about these items with Ramsey's help and decide whether you wanna put them on consent or move them back to a committee, saves you a month of time. And I think it's procedurally okay to do. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. There's there's nothing wrong with council, of the whole, council as a whole um, considering these things. As Sean mentioned, usually council has the benefit of the committees fleshing out uh, the discussion, but there's nothing wrong with council discussing it in the absence of a committee recommendation. All right, then let's do it. Ramsey Reiner, come on down. How's everyone? This is on. Can you hear me? Okay, um, the first order of business, and I know, uh, thank you, um, because Adam Lowe is in the audience, so his time's more precious. I'll be here at every meeting anyway. Um, the first item agenda, which we did previously speak at a parking committee about, but we did not, 
we needed to follow up is to discuss a lease. For, there's the lease uh, circumstances at lot 10 with JLo and Associates. So currently there are, I think, 53 spaces, or no, there are over 70 spaces at the lot. There were 10 that were being utilized by the Cheston House, which at the last parking committee before, I'm sorry, June parking committee meeting, we asked that they transition to Chestnut Street Garage as the lease is extinguished um, and if any new ones begin. Um, there's also a lease, and when I say lease, I don't have anything in writing, which is why there were none provided as attachments. There are no leases in writing. Um, but there's an agreement with J Loan Associates. It was first approved for 53 spaces at lot 10. Um, my understanding was that they were being utilized for the construction of 44 West on Gay Street, Jack's Corner, that building. Um, they have since um, decreased to 20 parking spaces, but I think currently only three are being utilized. So my recommendation to parking committee was that we ask as the lease that is existing with the three spaces extinguishes that we allow them to utilize Chestnut Street Garage as needed without any formal agreement. Um, there was discussion about whether this was tied to a land development project. This was not memorialized in the land development plans for 44 West. Um, I do know there were discussions on council, so I did provide the minutes um, that there was the allowance for 53 spaces at lot 10, but it was not a formalized lease and it was not due to land development agreements. Um, so it's a little bit different than the lease that we had at lot seven with Brian McFadden because that was per the zoning ordinance and required for the land development. Um, does anyone have any questions? So that's gonna free up 50 spaces. Right, so my, my biggest concern is that if you drive past lot 10, which is the growers market lot at the corner of Chestnut and Church Street, um, it often looks unavailable because of the red and white leased signs and um, so a lot of people don't park on that side, even though it is for, it, it is available after 5 p.m. So my goal would be to make that a fully transient lot so we can understand the use and then understand you know where we'll go from there. And I think there's probably plenty of opportunities to improve that lot. So is it to move 53 spaces or 20 spaces for JLo? I don't, I think at this point, what we would do is ask to extinguish, we don't have an agreement, but we would, remove the signs and allow JLo, um, if they're still using, utilizing those three spaces to provide the lease showing that, that those are still required at that lot and allow them to finish out that lease and then ask them to just utilize Chestnut Street as any other business would to, you know, get monthly passes or, which is actually what the county's decided to do for Chestnut Street as well. Um, that way they can utilize, if they need 50, they can get 50 there if they need because we do have Moody's that pulled out and we lost 90 uh, monthly accounts so they can use what they need and we don't have to modify it and there won't be a lease agreement because we don't really do that with any other businesses. And and Mr. Lowe is here if, I, if you have any questions for him as well. I have a quick question. Sure. You said this was never memorialized nor is there a lease in place. So there was, would that be then correct to say there was never a payment in place either? No, they have been paying consistently. Um, so they have been paying. It was being managed by Reef, uh, the garage management company. They were making payments to the garage management company who was managing the leases at Lot 10. Uh, a few months ago, we took that over so that we could monitor payments. So they, they were paying, and they were paying for all of the spaces. Even though, though they weren't using more than three, they were paying for the full 20. Um, in hopes that they might utilize them at some point, but it's not allowing for the full use of the lot for everyone else in the borough. And that's my biggest Thank concern. You. Yeah. Um, any com Any more questions from up here? I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. So the, we have the growers market at least in some spots and that's limited. Right. And then we have three spots that are currently being utilized under an old lease that has expired yeah it was it's not agreement okay, yeah fine. yeah so, so we would still retain the three spots for mr Lowe. as long as the lease that he has states that those are required otherwise i would say just 
allow everybody to go to Chestnut Street. Um, so the recommendation is just to to allow the majority of the spots now to be publicly mm -hmm. available through a kiosk. Yes. I mean, it seems, I don't know why, of course. <laughs> Mr. Lowe is creeping up slowly. <laughs> you need to say anything? <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> Good evening, appreciate your time. Adam Lowe, J. Lowe and Associates, also represent D-Town Associates, who was the original applicant on the Moss Jelly redevelopment. You know, as I've reported to the parking committee before and provided some documentation of the council meetings, you know, it was an important component of our land development. Was it required by land development? It wasn't. Uh, do I believe council made a recommendation and approved a lease with J Lo Associates or D Town Associates for 53 spots in Lot 10. I think the record reflects that. You know, councils act, asked to act and put things on the consent agenda at every one of these meetings, and they do that. Then they approve that. That that's what happened. So in 2018, those mean, minutes reflect that. Um, as part of that, you know, we leased. I, there, I understand the the question about whether it's construction. It was never intended for construction. We utilize that and that helped relieve some of the on-site parking or the on-street parking, uh, which some of our contractors were parking in. Um, so we allocated some of those spots to those guys, but we paid for them the whole time. So if you look at from a economic record, uh, when we entered into that lease, we started paying on all 53 spots. Midway through COVID, we were approached by Mike Perone. I think Holly may have brought this to our attention that, hey, that there aren't there are a lot of spots in that lot that that aren't being used. You're paying for them. Why are you paying for them? You know, is there something that can be done? We agreed. We said, listen, as long as we're not losing what we perceived our rights, again, no lease was signed. We recognize that um, for those spaces. You know, we're happy to give back 30 spaces. You know, we felt that was give us some comfort, still allow us to do our leasing with our tenants at 44 West. Um, so we gave them back. I have a couple emails between myself, Hector, and Mike Perone talking about that, again, agreement as we understand it. We've since then continued to pay on those 20 spaces. So if you looked at from a landlord contribution or an owner contribution, we spent over $100,000 in that lot. It's $1,200 a month that you're extinguishing here by no longer wanting that lease in place. And we're happy to continue that. We're also will willing to and um, Mr. Nagel's representing us and working with uh, Kristen Camp a little bit uh, on trying to find an agreement. We're absolutely amenable to moving them over to Chestnut. Our concern are the two components to what this uh, agreement was. We call it, I refer to agreement. So please don't think that I'm assuming that I have some written agreement in place. I don't. Um, but the two components to this approval from council were the right of first offer or right of first refusal on those spaces as well as a lease. Both of that language is contained in the approval documents for the minutes. So I look at the existing leases. What's the impact on my directly on my customer? I have one customer, Trellis, who leases three spaces in the Chestnut lot. The borough has been good enough, and it sounds like the conversation here is we can retain those and keep those um, going. We're very thankful for that because that's important to that tenant. She has a longer walk to the Chestnut garage and has some security concerns. Um, their business relocated from Wilmington, so they have a different feeling for what, you know, we might feel differently about the borough of Westchester. So we're happy to have that. We're happy that we can maintain that. That is a long-term lease. So there's probably, there's, I think we looked at that. Is there three years, four years left on the lease, I think? And then they've got renewal terms, but side issue. The other component is the right of first refusal. And I guess I look at council and go, what, if an action to council provided this lease or made the opportunity for a lease as well as a right first refusal. And you're saying that doesn't exist. And what does it mean? Like as a, as an owner and a large owner of office space, parking's important. It's parking important to everybody in the borough, you know, but when, as we develop new buildings and, you know, add value to the market and to the borough, and we're hopeful that the borough will honor its commitment to us. And if that means some form of right of first refusal that we could have, at the beginning of each year. So in the event that the office users within our some of our buildings come back into the office and need more parking, that we have the opportunity to lease the space. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my, my understanding of the whole situation, uh, unfortunately, yeah, you don't have anything written and, and unfortunately not having something written and keeping it in perpetuity is kind of a, 
you know, it's been, if, if something happened in 2018, that was what, how many years ago at this point? Six, yeah, it's a while. And and the fact of the matter is, it's what we, we hope is that builders, when they are building, and this is why we are looking at the parking um, regulations for new buildings and everything, is that you build enough parking for the people that are gonna be in your buildings. We, we don't want that burden pushed off on the borough. And so that's why we're making some of those changes. And so hopefully um, in other new developments, you know, you you don't, have to rely on borough parking for your tenants, you are able to supply parking for your tenants as well. Um, that's, but, but so that's kind of my opinion on those, those points that you brought up and, and why I would support these changes that Ramsey is, is suggesting, because I think uh, you've had, uh, had a while, you're not really using them. So to have them sit there empty with a con contract, that's not really there. It's just like, maybe was made verbally a while ago. There's there's not a whole lot of reason. It it's, makes more sense to the borough, to our residents, to and to those that are visiting our businesses to have those spaces available. Any other opinions, thoughts? I'm in agreement. Yeah, I tend to agree with you, just said. Nicole. Okay, any, any other comments from residents? So I think Sean, we can put this one on consent agenda for for tomorrow. I appreciate that. And I understand the opinions here of council may conflict with what we as business owners would need in the borough or, or thought we were getting. You know, 2018 was a different time than it is 2024. We recognize that. Recognize that the ordinances that were in place and how that building at 44 West got developed was because it didn't need to rely on it because instead we built a plaza. We took down office space to create a incredible environment we believe is a heart of the borough now. And part of that was relying on, yes, there is gonna be parking out there available. It's important for those tenants and it will affect our buildings. So, you know, I understand the position the council's taking. I don't agree with it, quite frankly. I think it to be to our detriment and ultimately to the borough's detriment if we can't provide parking for some of the office, whether it be the premier office, or another office in the borough. All right. Well, thank you, Madam thank Chair. You. What's the what's the difference between uh, right right of first refusal beginning every year uh, because we don't know what is the, what their um, tenant ratio is going to be. It may not change, but every year when we go to give we do the uh, lottery for 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 the, for the parking lots. Uh, what's this, the the I was on the council when we approved the, the, the actual parking spots and they should have been memorialized and that's the borough's fault. And it's also J Lo's fault for not making sure that it wasn't memorialized. And, but, uh, since it was passed by borough council, I guess everyone just assumed it was legal and it was, it was a full fledged agreement, but every year based on, since he is, since that company is a, a very large tenant in town and that building is one probably the biggest draw in the borough is there anything wrong with giving the ownership the right of first refusal up to 10 parking spots they have 20 now uh, up, up, up to 10 parking spots in the event that their tenant ratio changes you know it, it's or do you have enough spots in chestnut square i mean chestnut uh parking garage um as, as as of right now, even with the hotel coming in, there's there is plenty of space at Chestnut Street because Moody's is no longer utilizing the 90 spaces. My feelings of first right of refusal, while I understand that this was a beautiful development in the heart of Westchester, and I don't disagree with any of that, my understanding was that they were allowed to develop that without parking requirements. That didn't mean that the borough had to provide them. And if you give one business Right of first refusal, you're setting a precedent that I don't know if we want to continue doing. I do know if we make this a fully transient lot, I do think there's an opportunity once we understand the the actual transient utilization of this lot that if it's if it's not fully used every day, then maybe we do consider splitting the lot and doing a lottery for lease spaces there. But again, we talk a lot about equitability here and being equitable, and I think that that would be the fairest way instead of giving it to one property. You would create some sort of lottery and, and allow it in that sense. That was just my opinion. Yeah. I, I sat on council at that time. 
And there were supposed to be 80 parking spots underneath that building. And the time borough council um, through the land development, you know, thought that with a verbal agreement, which is in the minutes all the way back mm -hmm. that, you know, they started with 53 and, um, and then they narrowed it down to 20. So, but, you know, it's, it's, um, as long as we have plenty of spots, you know, for, you know, the, the, I would the say developer. as of right now, I mean, I obviously with the way, hopefully the transportation committee can help with some guidelines, you know, we're obviously not rolling in parking spaces around here, but I think that by the time they might need utilization of more spaces, maybe we have an opportunity to deck lot 10 or lot six, like we've also discussed. So, you know, yeah, I think what's important here, Mr. Lowe, is that you will still have access to parking, right? And as your tenant occupancy increases, you know, that's another discussion with the borough or with, you know, lease spaces at Chestnut Street or maybe even lease spaces at lot 10. Right now, I, I think we see it as underutilized, although it's, you know, generating income to your point. Um, but I, I live in that ward and I go to that parking lot and you, I don't know where to park. Because every one of those, you know, you'll find one in between every maybe five spaces. You know, there's one that doesn't have a sign on that says lease parking. Um, I, I think, you know, we all hear your concerns and we're not blocking you from the ability to provide parking for, and we want to continue to work with you. Uh, but at this time, I think there is a, an overall need to open up that parking. We're going to honor the three leases that you have. Should you have 10 in six months? That's another discussion that, you know, we can have around Chestnut Street or, or lot 10. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're still at the point we're putting that on consent. All right. Number eight. So. In town right now, we currently utilize two apps if you ever pay for parking. So we use Passport on the meters. We use Flowbird in the lots. Uh, we've done a lot of internal discussion, gone back and forth about the right app for the borough. After much discussion, I, I'm not sure if it traveled to full council, but we had thought we were going to go with Park Mobile. Um, at this point, after looking into it, we are proposing to go with Flowbird for a few reasons. Um, one, it would cut down on the apps for the user throughout the borough. So every lot and kiosk and uh, space in town would be, the new meters would all be Flowbird. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to make sure that we can um, stabilize the processing fees that are passed on to the user. So Park Mobile had a few parking tiers of ways that you could pass the service. There's a lot of processing, <laughs> system processing fees that we I was not aware of. So while, and Flowbird has a, a a lower transaction fee. So they're charging 25 cents a transaction to the end user, whereas Park Mobile charged 45 cents. Um, Flowbird also allows us to pick our own credit card processing company so that we can uh, streamline how many we utilize for the borough overall, but we can also shop around and make sure that we have the lowest rates so that when users are parking in town and they have to pay the service fees, we can make sure that we do our due diligence to keep them lower. I was concerned that you'd be parking in town for an hour for $1.50 and end up with like a $1.50 service charge on top of that. So we didn't want to price people out of parking. Um, with this, because we're purchasing kiosks for downtown, if we go with Flowbird, they will also give us a 5% discount on the kiosk purchase, which is also a benefit. And it also cuts us down to three internal software systems because we're currently utilizing four for the parking department. So it would slice one off, which would be much appreciated. I do have one quick question. Sure. So I got to download another app, Flowbird. Well, technically it's already here because it's what is being used on Westchester campus and they use it. What about the other app that I have? Is that still going to be valid too? No, we're going to get rid of passport. So everything moving forward is Flowbird. Everything will be Flowbird. And I'll tell you, like I saw it in Finland. I see it in New York City. They have Detroit. So it is a, a well-renowned company and they're also, Park Mobile did just purchase them. So whatever 
things you love about Park Mobile will likely trickle down to Flowbird as well. And when will this take place? I would like to get this done. Uh, our passport contract is finished on August 31st, so I would like to transition before then so that we could be, uh, even the meters in town would just be modified to Flowbird until we fully do the rollout of kiosk placement downtown. We're we're going to have a lot of signage. Um, Flowbird is also providing an ambassador program and a PR um, rollout to help us roll it out. Mitch, who works, uh, who Mitch Butts, who works for Butts Tickets, who's local, he also has offered, <laughs> excuse me, to um, participate. We're going to try and do tables at like restaurant festival and different borough uh, events so that we can roll it out. And then I will, you know, help with Westchester University as well. But we'll try and do a really Good rollout, <laughs> but but with Flowbird you don't have to use the app to pay, right? There's so, going to be the kiosks in place. There will be so. kiosks. There's the app. You can pay by text. I believe you can scan a QR code, and I think you can also pay by phone. So there's many ways. So if you don't want to download an app and you or you only have a flip phone, um, you can do it that way, or you can pay at the kiosks in town. And these will also have uh, the opportunity, I'm sorry, for uh, validation codes. So once we get fully functional, we can work with the local businesses and they can provide validation codes that are used, utilized on the kiosks as well. Well, I have one app for parking on my phone. I don't know when I put it there, but it's Flowbird. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <I'm> okay. <laughs> Any anything any any comments from the residents in attendance? All right, are we good? Are we good? Consent? Consent? Okay. Thank you. All right, number nine. Uh, so we are currently we have our two garages. They are being managed by Reef in Park Imperial Parking. I'm not. I'm never sure what to call them because everyone has a different name. Um, the the agreement is scheduled to extinguish at the end of August on August 31st. I'm just asking that we can extend this until October 31st because we are trying to modify the RFP in a little more intricate of a way where it needs it needs coordination with finance, public works, because we're going to try to take some of the management off of the company so that we have more control financially um, so that we understand the revenue and we're really clear on that. So this is just two months. Question? All right. Yeah. Any anything from the those in attendance? All right. Consent. Thank you. Number ten. Sure. Um, this is to direct the solicitor to draft an amendment to Chapter One Hundred. This is the um, portion of the ordinance that manages how lots are metered or how the parking is utilized there. So right now it lists lots six and seven as um, with parking meters, but we have approval to move kiosk uh, multi-space meters to both of those lots. So I just need to update the ordinance to reflect the parking times. And lot seven also has the lease with Brian McFadden that was approved. So I need to modify that. So it's really just a, to clarify and update it from meters to kiosks. I have no Not comment. Anything from those in attendance? All right. I guess we're good. consent. Thank Glad you. Glad we decided to go over these. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Accomplished. Good. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. Public works. Good evening. Uh, would you like for me to introduce uh, the bid? Uh, oh, oh, the, just yes. Number eleven, motion to approve a bid for paving of borough roads to Glasgow in the amount of three hundred forty-eight thousand six hundred dollars. That's it. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, they are RCO or responsible contractor ordinance uh, compliant. Um, it's uh, below our estimate. Um, they paved our roads last year. We had a good experience. I think they had a good experience with us. Um, my recommendation is that council uh, approve a contract uh, for Glasgow. 
No, I think from consent. All right, number 12, motion to approve the base bid $176,116 and bid alternate $70,732, construction of Goose Creek stormwater management facilities, 205 Lacey Street and Matlack Street for a total bid amount of $246,848. Hello everyone. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, the action item is uh, the two a recommendation from Public Works Committee last month or last week is to approve uh, the base bid for this project as well as the alternate. Um, we only got one bid, which is kind of a drag. Um, our original budget was two hundred forty thousand. This came out in two hundred forty six with an expanded scope, which I can talk about in detail if you'd like. Um, so, one bid is a bit of a drag, but um, Costs are within expectation and uh, best part is we have 2 grants that will cover 100% of the construction costs. So this is a free construction projects to uh, the residents of the borough and everyone who pays stream protection fee. The contractor is premier concrete um, may sound familiar. They just finished the project up at high minor street. Um, great job on that project. So we were happy to echo what Don said about the paving contractor. Um, we liked working with them. I think they liked working with us. It's, it's nice to see a contractor finish up a project and immediately bid on another one. That means they like you as a customer. Um, this actually falls below the threshold for responsible contractor ordinance, but Premier was certified from the high and minor project under the ordinance. So we know we have a good outfit here. A um, lot of conversation about this project last month, as well as last week, and I can go into as much or as little detail as you'd like. This was a committee recommendation. Um, Mr. Flynn, you were not able to connect. Um, Sheila and I had a bunch of conversations about this because there, there's a lot of things in motion just in general and stormwater and rain gardens and all these. Yeah. We recommend that we uh, uh, approve the bid for the work to move move forward. I'd like to have it on discussion, please, because I want to go over in detail the rain gardens. Okay, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go through this presentation tonight, or just no? We can do it tomorrow night for the discussion on all the rain gardens because there's a lot of opposition for the rain gardens that, that I've heard, and I want to make sure that everybody understands what we're doing. So, please put it on discussion. Well, I'd, I'd like to make some comments first. Yeah. So, yeah. let me let me do my comments. So, so here's what I understand, because I think a lot of the discussion and I've, I've had some extensive conversations with with will and Don and and other Don who's not here tonight and Sean about the whole, the whole thing. Right? This is where it sounds like we're, we're a little bit. Confused that I've been confused, but I think I get it now. And my, my understanding is. Bernie, what you are concerned about is. The long term plan, so there's this long term plan that's out there that you guys did what like years ago for DEP, right and you're and they've come back and they've said, we don't like it. And you're in the process of revising it right now. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Okay, it's not that they don't like our plan, but the the period it, of the plan is ending and we need to rewrite it. We, okay, so and, we and a bunch of projects that uh, we. We said we would do 5, 6, 7 years ago before the regulations had crystallized are not feasible. And the reason they're not feasible is uh, space. Um, the, we have to do these small pocket projects throughout the borough to meet these regulations. So, so that plan is being reworked and there's a lot of conversation over that plan. I have some objections to that. I did a, my own little walkabout um, with this past weekend and I sent them all to, to um, the management. And, and there's, there's definitely conversation and from my understanding from the process, we have a, some opportunity over the next months, months to be able to influence that longer term rewrite plan. Right? That that's, that's my understanding. Like the way the process works is. You said yesterday, you're like, you, they submit it to DEP, DEP kind of approves it, then it comes back and then we all get a chance to look at it and say what we want to change. And then the changes happen and then the plan doesn't get actually become a real plan 
until all those changes happen and we approve it as a borough council. So, so that's the long-term plan that, that I've definitely been pushing back against because there's a lot of pieces that I do yeah. not like about which, it. Which is six to eight months from completion. And we're in the early feedback stage and then there's a revision process. Then once we're all on the same page, we submit to DEP and then they approve it. And then there's a state, there's a legally mandated uh, public comment period. And then it comes back to you for a final vote. And that's where the six or eight months process. Um, so that is a revision of the pollution reduction plan and total maximum daily load strategy for the Goose Creek watershed. Uh, it's about stormwater quality improvement. And uh, to, to improve the stormwater quality, we have to build a bunch of projects like the ones uh, that uh, is out to bid at the moment. <clears throat> so with that, I don't think we need to put it on for discussion for tomorrow. To you. Yeah. So, I just, no, but that has to be a motion made. No, it so, yes, it does. Let, 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 me let me finish my bits. I think we should have Mr. Gill. All right, hold on. That. Hold on, Brian. Hold on. Let me let me finish my other my other bits though, because I, I, I I'm that that's kind of where I'm leading. So so um my my understanding with what you're proposing now, Will, is a is a piece. It's a it's a it's a piece that we've gotten grant money for. We've already been talking about it, and it's a piece. And really, all it does is it takes the borough Lacey Street property and puts in this what's it called a swale a swell yeah, rain gardens and a bioswale a bioswale in the Lacey Street, which is you know in the parking lot of Lacey Street by the by the creek, and then it puts two rain gardens at the end by the stop sign on Matlack and Lacey. And I walked around and looked at it and watched traffic and those particular pieces, I'm actually okay with. And I live right around the corner from them all. I, I actually looked at it. I've talked extensively with the team about them and, oh yeah, thanks Bill for pulling it up. I'm actually okay with it because the, it's at the end of the street. There's no turning into them. It's one way. There's already cars that'll be parked when students are in. They'll be parked on both sides. So the visibility of them being there it will be, it won't be so hard because- How does Bill get in that picture? <laughs> yes, that, that is Sean. So, so, person has a hat like that. so my point is though, this, this piece actually is, is we have the money it's been worked on for a while. It doesn't seem like it's it's not a, offensive to me like some of the other portions of the long-term plan that I would like to continue to have the discussions over. And, and I'm okay with it. So I personally, I, and going back to, I personally don't feel like it has to go on discussion. I, you know, it's my, my ward and everything. And I think if we're just looking at this piece to get started, it's okay. And then we have opportunity to discuss that long-term plan for six to eight months. All right, I remove it, but I'm gonna vote against it. So we can move forward. Is, is there a specific concern you wanna spend two minutes on tonight? Okay. A any comment from those in attendance? Uh, Daryl Sprite behind you. Daryl Cook, South Walnut Street. Is a west side bump out necessary on Matlack Street? Could the water be piped to the east side? Uh, were, the, uh, were there any satellite photos taken of parking at night on South Matlack Street? I, I think for about eight months of the year, the excess parking comment is erroneous. Thank you. Yeah, Dar Daryl, and, and there was a comment last week by Ms. Carroll that we, we are aware and we're very sensitive to parking supply. And we do know from the parking study that a large chunk of the southeast of the borough in the evenings does not have a lot of on street park and utilization is up over 90%. We're aware of that that's why we're trying to be sensitive about where we put these um, installations for sure. You're absolutely right. 
And and that's where too we need to talk a little bit more with well, Zepp that who was here a couple of weeks ago who says there is abundance of parking down over at the university that doesn't get utilized. How can we make sure that these students um, that are parking on the streets find their way to available parking down there? Um, so so that's a con another conversation we have to have for sure. sure. I, if I may, I'd like to just talk parking for two minutes because I, I think that's the gist of it, right? And we always say everything in the borough comes back to parking. Um, parking is a symptom. Uh, the disease is uh, oversaturate, oversaturation of rentals, uh, specifically student rentals. A um, couple things here to uh, hopefully put your ease of mind if you have concerns about parking. Uh, first, we looked at every no parking area on the block and uh, found two um, that were, one was codified in 1982, but it's painted incorrectly. At some point, it was extended beyond where it was codified. So we put a sign there that says, we're gonna expand off street parking unless there's a really good reason we don't know about, please let us know. That was two and a half weeks ago, we haven't heard anything. The other is kind of what I call a landlord special. Someone wants a designated parking spot outside their rental property when they swing by once a month to do whatever. So they go out there with a can of yellow paint, paint it and then they have a parking spot. Um, so there's two spots that will be returned uh, to the people who live and park here, uh, regardless of whether or not this project goes forward. Uh, the bump outs, um, so, so with those two spots, if we do the bump out piece of the project, that's a net zero impact. So there's no impact to parking here, but Ramsey and her team are doing a bunch of really important stuff using data that we've collected and, and organized. Uh, one is um, the, you all remember the, um, visitor pass thing so um two visitor passes per student rental and almost every house on this block is a student rental so that's probably 20 or 30 guest passes that might not be able to utilize be utilized on this block the other thing is the number of parking permits available per property is now capped at the sum of the number of people on the lease minus the off street parking spaces. Um, and all but three houses on this block have off street parking. So that's probably another 20 or so parking permits previously being sold to people that will not be sold. And, and that all these changes haven't hit yet because the, the student rental uh, parking permit you know, that doesn't really pick up until August when the students come back. So I think a lot of the Southeast and a lot of our student intensive neighborhoods are gonna look and feel a lot different parking wise uh, this fall, thanks to uh, Ramsey and all the good work she's doing. Um, and then lastly, we also talked about um, uh, Greenfield Park as a, a designated permit. And every year there's spots that aren't utilized. It's the availability, the eligibility is capped based on where you live, but because there's spots that aren't being sold, we could maybe uh, ex expand that a block or two and uh, get some more cars off these streets and into the lots. And yes, you're right, there are empty garages at Westchester University for almost free. And it's a, almost free parking down there. So uh, all things that will uh, help with parking. Yeah, uh, the only thing I would say is, I, cause I walk past the, the one address where the sign is, and I mean, they definitely have like four or five cars that they park in their, their driveway. My understanding from the historian known as my father was that that was an old beer distribution place years ago. And so in the family that had the beer distribution, they don't have that anymore, but they still live there. And so they all do park in there. So just make sure because people still park, they can park across the street. So you just wanna make sure that they can turn out of their place because they don't have the opportunity to go as far across the street, like one block down. Mm -hmm. When you come out of the alleys, you can see there's yellow so that you have turning radius to get out of the alley. The people coming out of that driveway don't have that. They have cars parked right in front of their driveway too. So you don't wanna take away one spot and then have five cars that have nowhere to park or have troubles. So just make sure when you're doing that, that even if you haven't heard from them, I don't know. I know part that Ramsey's had a whole thing with the, like the handicap signs and, and making sure if you don't hear back, you still find, try to find a way to reach out to them in a different way, so. No, I, I mean, I just wanted to say, um, uh, you know, I, I am for this project. Uh, to your point, Ms. Shimoni, I, um, you know, I trust your judgment. That's your ward. You walk up and down it. 
And so, but I do think this is a good first step and then we could progress and see where it needs to go from there. But if you look in that particular area, I mean, it always floods, you know, that part of town always floods. And I think that we need to do a better job of mitigating that and we can do that. I mean, you know, two things in life, you can't beat father time and mother nature, but at least we could at least, you know, stop it a little bit. But what it does overall, and I think I send this to, uh, to all of you up here, but I want to let the public know, I mean, this particular project, I mean, what it can do is it could reduce flood damage. That's what we want. That's what we want. It could lower stormwater management costs for the future. It could improve the quality of water that's going to go into the streams. It could enhance property values. No one wants to live in a particular flood area, you know, with insurance costs and whatnot going through the roof. People this year were impacted when they got their, you know, insurance bills, car and homeowners. Um, you know, there's uh, economic incentives that, you know, we'll mention here. 100% of this is being paid for through a grant. To me, I look at that as a no brainer. Uh, it could reduce health care costs, um, waterborne disease, mold, things of that nature that comes in people's homes. And finally, it's a job creator. You know, we're actually creating jobs. Potentially, people can be paying into the system through an earned income tax. We don't know yet, but uh, I am for the beginning stages of this project. I trust Ms. Shimoni's judgment. It's her ward. She knows it better than any of us on how we got to move forward after that. Can I just ask one question? Um, one of the pieces of feedback that actually Mr. Vice President actually went around and talked to people on the street about rain gardens, one of the concerns is mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we're used to it because there's a lot of mosquitoes that breed over in yeah, the sure. Creek area and those wet areas. Um, is there, do you have an answer or any way that, um, that you can potentially uh, address that concern around mosquito? Yeah, um, and it's always the first question we get. Um, I think it was two years ago, we finished Greenfield, started to warm up. Um, I remember this because it was my wife's birthday and it was a Saturday and I had to, for some reason, looked at my work email and I had to email some residents back about why, why uh, they didn't need to be worried about mosquitoes, but uh, it's tricky because they are designed to hold water. Um, but they're only designed to hold water for 24 to 48 hours. Um, that's easier said than done. Um, the holding of the water is which what's holding it back from the stream and the floodplain. Um, so mosquitoes need about one week of standing water to, um, to breed and, you know, lay the eggs and, and eggs hatch and all that. And, um, and it has to be the same water and it can't be moving. And, uh, you know, so our job, part of our maintenance responsibilities is to make sure that the amount of water that's being held, the time it's being held is reasonable, but we haven't had that issue at any of the gardens yet. Um, over time, I, I would expect that to become more of a concern. Um, but so far, everything's working as intended. Like I said, it's our responsibility to maintain it, but you know, it would have to be, it would be have to be seriously flawed in design or construction or neglected for a long time to get to a point where it's holding water for a week. <clears throat> Hi, Shannon Mandine. I live at 711 South Matlack Street. Um, I walk past this intersection daily walking my children to preschool. I would be thrilled to have a rain garden at that intersection. I think it would make the area look nicer. I am an avid gardener and Mr. McGinnis, I had to get behind every single thing you said about all the things we need to do to improve our stormwater management, to better our environment. We are a busy borough that has a lot of people and we put a lot of pollution onto the ground and we should be doing everything we can. And when it is a grant funded project that costs zero dollars, I see, I mean, as somebody who lives, walks, works, parks, all in that area, I don't see a problem with it. Also, I can say that um, 501 South Matlack is not a student rental. It has no parking in it, but that's a Westchester University professor who is a science professor. She is um, insects and ants and things like that. And she'd be thrilled about this too, for the record. 
Thank you. All right, I think we're at consent. Consent, yep. All right, let's move to public safety events and quality of life committee. So item 13, so I, I filled in for Lisa this past week or last week. So I, I'll bring it up a motion to approve five year police services contract with East Bradford township. Um, I think this is just the yeah, standard up. Oh, yes. Kristen, uh, we think the smartest thing to do is to discuss it this evening. Uh, if you are satisfied with the substance of the agreement, uh, that's fine. Uh, but then put this on the discussion agenda for tomorrow night in that same race. All right, let's do it. So, so who is going to start the discussion? The discussion is tomorrow. I, I thought we were going to discuss it tonight. No, it, we're not going to discuss it at all tonight, though. At the... Ah, okay. Well, well, with that, Mr. Gill, when when it's presented, it won't be on consent, but then we'd have to make a motion to move that to consent tomorrow, correct? You can't do that, or you can just approve the resolution. Or just approve the resolution. Okay. Okay, so my understanding is that this is the same agreement that's been in place. The only changes uh, are in the dollar figures, uh, which are highlighted on pages four and five of the document. All right, so we'll put it on for discussion tomorrow. If anyone hasn't had a chance to read it, please make sure you read it and we'll get some more information tomorrow for the resolution process. Thank you. I'd also like to remind council, this is uh, at least we've had yearly with uh, East Bradford for quite a while. And, um, uh, it, and the manager there and, and the borough manager here and Chief Lee says uh, it's an event advantageous lease for both the township and the borough. Thank you. I guess uh, I, sh I should have opened it up to any any comments from the residents of, in attendance as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know I, I heard his presentation last week too, and it seems like it's there's no reason not to move it forward. It's just process. So we'll move to number 14. Motion to approve special event applications and waiver of parking fees for number one and number two. So friends of Marshall Square Park, they have uh, four concerts coming up, um, June 20th, July 11th, August 1st and August 22nd. Is that for, is that 2024, 2025, 2024? So, so that is one. And then the Westchester downtown foundation would like to have parking fees waived in chestnut square or chestnut street garage. And it's the up on the roof event that happens Saturday, September 14th. Um, my understanding is that we've been approving the waiver of these fees for the past couple of years, at least for the downtown foundation and possibly last year we waived them for, for the park concert. Any questions? No, but I believe the uh, one item that we had discussed and the mayor brought this up is looking at a, a more of a holistic approach to special events, events that benefit the borough wide and, ev and events that are uh, specific to wards. And that's something that we should look at moving forward. I have, I have no issue with items one, two, and three and four for that matter, but that's something that we should discuss, have a further discussion. Yeah, agreed. I, I think, yeah, I mean, 
And and that's that's something, yeah, because once we relook at this and Barbara's taking a look at the fee structure and everything, it, it may not be next year, oh, we did it last year, we're gonna do it again. Um, and because we'll have a different approach and a different philosophy to our our fee um, waiving for, for different events. So um, anyone that's getting these fees waived this year, you know, keep that in mind. We are relooking at it. So it's not necessarily a done deal for next year. So don't be surprised if for some reason you fall off or something changes. Um, but for now, yeah, one and two was the, the fee waiving piece. And I don't think there was a whole lot of the, the committee recommended it to zero. Um, the other two items, three and four, were just the the applications, the official applications for these events. So the restaurant festival, which we all know and love, and the um, American Legion, the the parade for the veterans. Of course, you know, you know, we should support our veterans as many ways as possible. So I don't think there's a whole lot of opposition there. Any any comments from those in attendance? All right, we'll put this on consent. All right, and we're moving to smart growth. Motion for no solicitor attendance at July 22nd, 2024 zoning hearing 650 North Franklin Street. Uh, Michael, did you wanna say anything? You want, do you want me to just explain it, Sean? This is the one where it's just the extension of their their roof or their their garage. Now, this is a previously granted dimensional variance by the zoning hearing board, and the applicant did not commence construction or get their permits within 12 months of the issuance of that order. So, the matter before council is whether or not it wishes to oppose the extension of that. Um, uh, order. So we recommended not to send the solicitor to that. Okay. All right. Consent. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion for no solicitor attendance in the August 26, 2024 zoning hearing for one South Brandywine uh, at the amended application. And we do have Shannon here. And, and this is everyone came together, neighbors, lawyers, the Mandines, and are shifting their um, proposal from a date care, child care to a rental unit in the um, second building on the lot. And so everybody, the, the neighbors are okay with it and everyone's okay with it. And we felt that if everybody's okay with it at this point, we don't need to send um, a solicitor to oppose it from our end. Any, any questions here? Anything from out there? Jan, no, okay, so consent. Okay, motion to approve amendment to chapter 112 zoning, parking space requirements and schedule public hearing for September 18th, 2024. So you've all should have seen the, the draft for the um, amendment to the zoning. And this is for the um, ordinance for the buildings and for building uh, the parking requirements. Any questions from those here? Yeah, I have one question. And uh, it's with respect to the stack parking for multifamily dwellings. There was an, uh, a line in here that got redlined, but then uh, I think as it was left, it was um, permitted for single family homes, but not for multifamily dwellings. I just wanna make sure I have that really clear. And that's what was intended here. But it is no stack. It's permitted for single family homes and not permitted for commercial buildings or multifamily. And that, that includes, okay. All right. That was my only question. Thank you. Any questions from those in attendance? I think that needs to be clarified. So you have, you have a question? Sean and Michael are trying to look it up. Because it is confusing. The red line that I have shows stack parking shall be permitted. The word only has been added. 
And then it goes on to read for non-residential uses, single family detached and single family attached. Um, is it your intent to not allow for stacked parking at non-residential uses? I'm, I'm just reading the red line here. It looks like it was, it was stricken out. I don't know if that was intentional. Well, it struck out multifamily residential. So stacked parking would not be permitted for multifamily residential. That's right. That's but, what, it, but it would be permitted for non-residential uses. Oh, okay. But and that and that that may be fine if that's the council's if that's council's desire. But I thought I heard you say that you understood that stacked parking would not be permitted for commercial uses. There there are a lot of student homes that stack parking all the time. Would they no longer be able to stack parking in their in their lots? I just want to clarify that stacked parking is currently permitted in non-residential uses, single-family detached dwellings, and attached dwellings, and multifamily resi residential, as recited in a couple of sections below that get at how you can assign certain spaces that are stacked to certain units and developments. You do allow stacked parking right now, and this uh, amendment would make the Create a narrower possibility of of employing stack parking because this amendment only allows it in single family attached dwellings where the where the garage for the exclusive use of the tenants is right below. So, what are you requesting, Brian? Uh, I don't know. I'm still not clear. Is it your understanding that stacked parking is allowed for non-residential uses? I, I don't think you're concerned about non-residential. Oh, I'm sorry. I, then I misunderstood you. That, that, I'm, I'm just saying you. I've started a confusion. Yeah, in 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 the southeast area where there's a lot of student parking, landlords have made it so that they've maximized the footprint to to allow many cars to park behind a house. The way I read this is that no, would, they would no longer be able to stack cars in on those properties. That that's what it, with that red line of multifamily residential, that's what that means to me. So I just I want to make sure that I'm reading it clearly before this. The concern about whether or not you could or would. Seek to remove stacked parking areas within student housing areas in the borough. Um, because if those stacked parking areas exist on a lot right now, then presumably the property owners and the tenants are going to continue to use that stacked parking. Um, but for new um, multifamily residential projects, Stacked parking would not be allowed. In other words, when when presenting their plans, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of stacked parking to meet their parking counts. So in new development, if they can't utilize stacked parking, we're just requesting that they they'll still have to provide all of the parking. We can't we're not pushing them back onto the street, correct? They're still going to have to accommodate this parking somehow. They just can't do it with stacked. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Does that answer your question? I yeah. I just didn't see where it was stipulating between new and existing. So I think well, that, that might be. It, yeah. It's it's it's. It gets into nonconformities and whether or not a lot as designed and used um, on the date that an ordinance as change to the zoning ordinance goes into effect uh, can uh, impact the ongoing use of that property. As a general rule, ongoing uses, uses that existed lawfully prior to a zoning change, uh, have the right to continue. Um, yeah, it, it's a I thought this was in. So, 
developer. Okay. Well, that would change my analysis. Um, if I thought I thought this was a zoning ordinance, um, and excuse me for jumping into this, um, but yes. So, given the fact that it's a saldo ordinance. Um, it would only apply if there was a subdivision and land development application being presented. Um, so, again, when developers present their land development plans for multifamily uses, they will not be able to take advantage of stacked parking. And as Ramsey pointed out, uh, they will have to provide for um, the required number of parking spaces under the zoning ordinance on that land development plan. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. And, and that makes sense because then otherwise we'd have to have all those buildings add units or you know spaces. A any other questions from council? And any questions, comments from those in attendance? All right, are we okay to put on consent? All right, consent. All right, motion to schedule a public hearing for ordinance amendment to chapter 66, housing and property maintenance um, for August, 20, August 21st, 2024. These are the regulations associated with uh, administering a short-term rental program that need to be adopted in tandem with the uh, zoning amendment permitting short-term rentals should council choose to do that. And uh, we're scheduling this, you're proposing that this hearing be scheduled the same night as that zoning hearing. Any question from those up here? We, we recommended, committee recommended 2 0. Any questions from those in attendance? Comments? All right, consent. All right, motion to approve June 2024 HARB submission recommendation. And it's item A, uh, 120 North Church Street, fence and gate to conceal commercial HVAC equipment. And committee recommended 2-0. This is the beautiful building downtown that has Church Head Wine and Twin Valley Coffee in it. Not that those aren't my two favorite places to go. And it's going to be a short uh, wooden fence that will conceal uh, HVAC equipment on the north side of that building. It has a recommendation, positive recommendation from the HARB with some minor conditions. And that is the equipment you're seeing there that'll be shielded by the proposed fence from view from the street. That picture was taken from the street. And that final picture is taken from the alley back towards the street. Any questions? No. Any comments? Nope. Consent. We go. All right. And we will move on to the Finance and Revenue Committee. Do you want me to take it? Go over. Yeah. Got go it. For it. Okay. Uh, so this is a motion to approve purchasing approvals one through seven. So I could read and summarize what one through seven are. Uh, so ten thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars to CCI Consulting. That's for coaching in remediation sessions. Uh, item two, 14,000 Eagle Point gun. That's for nine millimeter and 22 caliber ammunition for our police department. Item three, 27,830 to JP Smith contractors. That's, pre that's for pressure washing, painting at Goose Creek. Item number four, that's $29,402 to next gen automation. And that's annual service contract for the borough ma maintained buildings. Item number five, $13,496.52 to Portnoff. And that is for uh, expenses to collect the stormwater protection fee. Item number six, $12,540 to USALCO. That's phosphorus removal. And item seven, $64,153. That's a signal service, and that's for the traffic signal controller box. Any, any comments, public comments? 
the, the controller box that was smashed into over by um, earlier this year, right? That's, I believe that is yeah, correct. I think that's it. Okay, I guess we could put this on consent. Um, item 21, motion to approve the DCED Multimodal Transportation Fund grant resolution for the South High Street Streetscape Improvement Project. And basically that is for a grant for the uh, South High Street uh, quarter, in which case we would be updating the sidewalk and brickwork. Uh, Mr. Metric, you mentioned that's probably not going to go into effect till next year. Is that correct? That particular portion of the project? Yeah, we expect the PennDOT's work to begin in September and be about an eight or nine month project. And we would then go out to bid for phase one of our material upgrades, which include tree wells, um, curbing where it's not being done by PennDOT, sidewalks and um, decorative lighting for the first two blocks from minor south. And phase two of this project would take over from where I just left off, and this is the subject of this grant application, to go back to the same program and see if we can get some more money to help us finish phase two, which would take us down to Price and Magnolia Streets with and complete the town center streetscape on High Street. Great. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the dais? Public questions? Uh, I guess we could put this on consent if there's any objection. Consent? Okay. Consent. Uh, item 22, motion to amend the 2024 Streamwater Protection Fund Capital Budget Goose Creek Stormwater Management Facilities. And that was, we've already approved that. That was the premier concrete uh, bid. Uh, correct or Barb? Good evening. Um, this budget modification is to um, increase the the grants um, line item as well as the capital expense line item in fund 16. We're asking to increase this by $131,848. Um, this is to account for two grants that we did not have in the 2024 budget, um, the DCED ARPA small water grant and the DEP growing greener and then um, this line item will pay for the ask that was on um, the, the, the agenda earlier tonight for Premier Concrete, the $246,000 bid. Thank you. Any questions from the dais? Modifying the budget because we got more money from grants. Not That's a bad a no thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Any public comment? Okay. Looks like we could put this on consent. consent. And then item number 23, motion to approve monthly rental of $1,500, roughly six to eight months for the temporary use of a loaner ladder truck. Uh, this is something we all agreed upon three zero. Uh, and uh, any questions up here on the dais regarding that uh, monthly rental? I just have one question. So I, I did he hear this come up on the maybe public safety. So the fifteen hundred dollars, that's the lease, but there's also an impact to live to insurance. Is that covered here as well? I believe uh, the fire department is here. If you want to discuss the impact to insurance. Right. I believe that it, our insurance will cover it. Uh, Sean, correct me if I'm mistaken. If we might have to take I, I, out a supplemental policy, I just don't have. I don't have the exact number in front of me. The fifteen hundred dollars is correct for the monthly lease of the ladder truck, and I, Barbara's whispering a number in my ear. But uh, we'll get the exact number for you uh, to put on the consent agenda. There will be an insurance cost to insure this new apparatus. I think. It, it's roughly about $5,300 per year, which works out to. Uh, are you go laughing at me. Uh, 483 and a 3rd dollar per month. Um, is the insurance cost, so you are correct um, and what we did look into um, also was to see if insurance would cover the rental of this and it does not cover the rental of this. So this would be um, 
if we had this ladder truck in service for nine months, which we don't know how long the repair is going to take, you know more about that than I do, the total standing cost would be around $17,850. And we assume that the running costs, the operating costs are going to be just the same because it's, it runs on the same diesel. It's going to be used just as much as our ladder truck would. So we figure that's a wash, but this is an unbudgeted $17,850 amount of money. Presumably if we need it for 9 months that we'll need to. Uh, get a get permission and appropriation from borough council to spend out of the fire fund. Thank you. That was my question. It's part of the discussion last week. Any further questions? Any public comment? Looks like we could move consent? this to consent. Yep. Turn it back All right. You. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Other business. Um, motion to approve the June seventeenth and eighteenth, twenty twenty four borough council meeting minutes. Consent. consent. Other other business. Um, quickly, uh, our um, often talked about intersection on Montgomery Avenue, which is not in the borough. It's in West Goshen Township. <laughs> West Goshen. Bless you. <laughs> Was that a sneeze or? A... West Goshen has asked uh, the borough for a letter of support, and I didn't realize the timing of this. I got this late. Uh, last week before I could get it on the agenda. So they are going to make an application to PennDOT to uh, replace the culverts that cross, uh, that, that permit the water to cross under Montgomery Avenue with new box culverts. It should be able to handle up to the 10 year storm. I think that's about three and a half inches. Don't quote me on that of rain in 24 hours. So most of your rainfall events call, fall into that 10 year storm and lower. But for bigger storms, we're still going to have a flooded road, but this will be a big improvement and they're asking for a letter of support. So I kindly ask that council put it on discussion for tomorrow uh, for your consideration to offer a letter of support for this grant application. And maybe we get one of these problems fixed or improved. Any questions? No. Yeah, it sounds no. good. Any, any comments from those in attendance? All right. Let's put it on. You wanted discussion. Okay. Um, any other, other, other business? No, then we will adjourn at 8, 12 PM. Thank you everybody.